They stay here in uh, North Bay, Ontario. We're coming from uh, Mark Downey's cabin and Mark Taylor. Uh, they're gonna take me along here in North Bay and we're gonna go and chop some beaver. Go and uh, check some beaver sets and I'm sure we got a beaver or two. I've been very fortunate for the last 25 years to have a registered trap line in the West Arm Lake Nimbusing. And uh, I had a real special uh, guest appearance by Andrew Stanley from uh, the Northwest Territories came down. Uh, he's got to spend three days with myself and my, my partner, Mark Taylor, who's also an employee with the Fur Harvesters. He's our uh, trap relations manager. Uh, we spent three days, the first day kind of goofing around, getting to know each other, uh, having a beer, eating some food, listening to the, the waterfowl coming back on the land. The next day we got up early because uh, the weather was starting to go, getting pretty rough. A little skeptical, I don't usually trap this, this late in the year. It's been a, a late spring, it's, winter's been holding on a long time. But just prior to these guys getting here, Mother Nature started to warm up and they're calling for rain this afternoon. So it's in our best interest to get a great and early start, pull whatever traps I got left and uh, call it quits for the season. Some of the creeks have started to open up, so it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to get across them. And maybe some top water uh, since the snow is starting to melt. We've had some rain in the past few weeks, so hopefully the, uh, the skidoos make it through and we don't get stuck. <laughs> check some uh, beaver traps, beaver snares, uh, all under the ice sets, 330 conny bears under the ice sets and the snare poles, which, which is great. I never had a hands-on experience setting beaver poles or I didn't know a lot about it and I don't know a whole lot of people that ever have set snare, snare poles like that for beaver. Here, Taylor Meister, you do the honors. The ice doesn't look very good. <laughs> This is a big beaver, North Bay beaver. Looks like it was baited with a piece of poplar. There you go, chum. Ooh, nice. We have another nice beaver. Oh, that's a snare one, huh? Yeah. Snare pole. So the snares are set on opposite sides of the pole, all the way down through the water column. And the beavers get caught in the snare as they're swimming around trying to try to eat the poplar. Hmm. How far under the ice, uh, from the bottom of the ice, would you put your first snare? Right at the, right at the bottom right at, of the ice. Okay. Yeah. Beavers will try and chew the pole off right where they can get at it or where it's attached. So they'll want to chew it off right at the bottom of the ice or they'll want to chew it off uh, where it goes into the mud on the bottom. So oh, okay. That's why you want snares from top to bottom. Snaring is really, really effective. But if it's not freezing, you don't, can't set because if it's the best thing is like, it's got to be like 10 below at night because then if the, if the whole, as soon as you set it and the hole starts freezing over, yeah. then the beaver can't get up. If it's mild weather, you don't want to be snaring because if the beaver can get up, you're going to end up with like, you know, damaged pelts, lost beavers, and just it's not a, it's not a good method to use, but it's really effective when it's really freezing good winter conditions. Okay. We 
We always put like the beavers in the bag and keep them, especially when it's freezing. If they freeze your sleigh and stuff like that, it just keeps them clean. Going out and working with these guys on their chopland here in North Bay and seeing how they do the snare pole sets and, and like it was an experience that not a whole lot of people will ever see, you know, like if I wanted to set a snare pole set uh, like these guys did, I'd have to study on it, read about it, learn how to do it and actually go out in the field and do it by yourself. But when you have men like that, that actually do this for forever and they actually very successful at it. They, these guys know what they're doing, you know, it's uh, pretty impressive, you know, like these guys know their Fur Harvesters NWT wouldn't be possible without Fur Harvesters Auction, selling your fur to the world. Buffalo Airways, the home of the ice pilots. All internet equipment was brought to you by Cascom and Galaxy Broadband. And cruise accommodations were provided by Greenway Realty. Like I seen uh, in one of the previews I seen of uh, Andrew's show, he was using the, the, the the, the sticks like I was telling you about. It does the same thing. You just take this spring slide through each of those things there and you slide it right down to the bottom. Okay, and then instead of wiring the two poles, you just wire these two things together. You find the entrance. If the entrance is like between my legs here, you just shove it straight down to the bottom like that. And if the entrance, if it's a big house and there's a real big run, you can put like another one of these, like one in the entrance, one here, and one here and lots of times you'll have like a beaver and an otter or a beaver and a rat or two beavers or three beavers because the one gets caught blocks the entrance the other one kind of goes around catch them this one next one goes around catch them now i've traveled through overflow before but not to the extent in which we did like I don't know how far we traveled, it was probably 10 kilometers maybe, maybe 10 miles. It was constant water. Everywhere we went there was water, you know, we're cruising through overflow, slush, and got stuck a few times, uh, but you know, everything fell together just perfectly, you know, it was, it was great. That one was deep. A few days ago when we came by here, we've probably lost two feet of snow since I was here once, since Mark and I set these, these traps. And we come off of the marsh, all these sets of ponds all the way to here from my camp, we have to cross a little road here. And we, originally we just drove right over top, we didn't even know there was these, these uh, gads cut off, but the snow's melted at least two feet since then, so th these things sticking up, we, we can't get over to the snow machines, we're going to have to chop them off in order to get up on over this road to the next house. How's he doing, Mark? He's doing a good job. He's done this before. I'm fing overdressed, man. Whew. Yeah, I need a minute. Good, huh? Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry to make it work there. Oh, no problem. <laughs> it's melting out, you know, it's like plus 10 here. Like, we leave here River and it's like minus 25. And we come here and it's like tropical weather. It's, it was crazy. It was like plus 10, plus 14 the one day we went out and it was nuts. Beaver trapping in itself is one of the hardest animals I find to catch. It's got the biggest animal, the biggest traps, uh, the most effort required to catch them. You know, you're skidooing a long way or riding on your four-wheeler, going in a boat or a canoe. So, yeah, it's definitely a lot of labor to catch a, catch a beaver and, and put them up for sale. So.
How's it look, Mark? Like there's a lot of beavers in this house, you can tell because like it's it's melted right off, and it's like there's hardly there's, there's not a lot of ice anywhere around it. Trapping, I really enjoy just being outside. Um, you know, I'd, I'd rather be outside at any time rather than being indoors. Um, I like catching animals. The challenge involved in trying to harvest an animal, trying to think like that animal, you know, to try and assist you to catch it, um, and just being able to handle these these creatures. Some of them are pretty fascinating and pretty neat to see up close. So. Something suit on her. Something on her, I think. Oh, yeah. Come on. Nice beaver there, huh? Good size, eh? Oh, yeah. Now you so, can see the safety wire we put, ran it from the top of the pole to the bottom, yeah. and then tied the snares around the safety wire. Now, if we hadn't had that, another beaver's come along and chewed that off. Everything would be gone. Everything would have been gone. So yeah. That's what the safety wire does. We have one here. He's going to try and kind of stay to the green bush there a little higher to avoid the top to the top water there. Because I'm thinking if you go across here, pulling the big slants up, we're going to get stuck in the slush. And if he kind of breaks a trail where it's a little higher, we'll follow that way and it'll be a lot. A lot less precarious and we won't have to get out and push and get stuck in the slop. Because we got one more house to go and uh, the easiest route is, is the best one. Well we're going to let our man Andrew do the honors and check this one. But this time of year everything's getting soft. Yeah. But even in, in winter time you get a really big active house. You still got to be careful walking around the Even like minus 30, minus 40, you get a big house like this where you have like a dozen beaver in there. A dozen beaver traveling around make a lot of uh there's a beaver. Oh, there you go. Give me your poles there, chum. And that's pretty much textbook right there. Like the beaver comes out of the house, swears himself at the entrance of the, the, the conibear, bear, which is right in the entrance, he just follows right through. And like I say, multiple catches in an entrance like this. You know, a big gang, there's a big gang of beavers in there. They're coming in and out of the house all the time. So make the effort of setting one trap. Just to come back for one trap is kind of useless. If you want to get three or four or five beavers, you can get set up like this. Multiple catches, two, three, isn't uncommon. If you can find all three, two or three entrances, the same thing will happen. In this case, on this side of the house, the feed bed's right up against the entrance. You can't, we couldn't, you'd have to move too much debris. When you're working, when you're, when you're trapping around an active beaver house, it doesn't matter what time of the year it is, you got to really watch when you're close to an entrance. If you see like an indentation in the snow, the odds are you don't want to pass that with your snowmobile. Sometimes you can walk across, but there's gonna be far less ice there than any place else in the pond, any place else around the house. So the entrance is easy, easy to find, and there's not a lot of work. If you do have to chisel, it'll be a little bit of ice, but lots of times if it's a big, if it's a big house, there'll be very, very little ice there. So we pull up to the first house there, and you know, we come up and they pull their three sets or whatever they had, or they had, they had two beaver in the very first house. And then we went to the next house, they had three beaver in the second one, I believe, you know, that's, uh, it's pretty impressive. It's f***ing priceless. You know, you go with these guys and they show you how to do this stuff and they teach you these things, hands-on experience, you got questions, you ask them a question, they'll answer it, you know, this, this is priceless things, you know, like this, not everyone does things like that and it's hard to find people that actually do things like that. So like, what I just went through here this weekend working with these guys, you know, that's, that's priceless shit, man. That's stuff that you just, you don't, it, you don't come across it every day. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Fur Harvester's Auction, selling your fur to the world. The, the quotas work in, in the province of Ontario. Quotas don't apply to all species. Quotas apply for, for instance, beaver. And it's, it's on there for two reasons, to control, to control the population from overpopulation and to control from overharvest. So, for instance, all through the 90s, up until about 2008, my quota here was 225. Under the Game and Fish Act in Ontario, I had to legally harvest 75% of my assigned beaver quota. And how that works is, how they, how they come to that number is, 
They take the number of live beaver houses on your trap line and multiply it by 1.5 or 2 depending on the type of area you're in. If it's a really prolific area, there's lots of good feed, it could be 3 to a house, but usually it's like 1.5 to a house. So quite easily to say here, I got well over 100 beaver houses on my trap line, which is about 78 square miles. So legally I have to catch 75% of my beaver. The 75% you got to catch because they don't want them to overpopulate. If you just imagine if you know you left this, if you only took, there's 100 beaver houses in this township and I only took like 10, 12 beavers a year. In 10 years they'd be epic proportion, they'd eat themselves out of house and home, they'd become sick, uh, the roads flooded, and when the, even when the price of fur is high, I can't, even if beavers went to like a hundred dollar average, I couldn't catch over my quota because they don't want to over harvest. So the quota looks after, you know, looking after the population as far as over harvest and also making sure that enough's taken that it doesn't create problems for the townships, disease, damage to the roads and things like that. The morning we left to go check the traps, it was fairly cool and the snow had stiffened up so that was nice because it had been mild in the last few days and we'd had some rain so we got going as early as we could just as the sun was coming up. And we managed to get around in time to check all the houses um, and get back to the camp just before the conditions got so terrible that we wouldn't have been able to uh, make it around with the skidoos. As it was, we had a few times where we got stuck in the slush and had to uh, push ourselves out. So it was nice to get back to camp and finally be done. Okay, so we're going to hang these beaver for how long and uh, what's, what's the point uh, for hanging them overnight? Well, we're going to hang them up, let the water drain off of them and let the fur dry so that uh, once it's dry, we can uh, comb them out, get rid of any burrs and sticks or any mud or anything that's in them so they're ready to skin and uh, be nice and clean to put on the boards when they're ready to go. So these will hang till morning, I guess? Yeah, yeah. We hang them up by the front foot, all the, the water will drain off the, the guard hair and it won't get down inside the, the under fur. So how I do with the oh, okay. legs there. We just wrap that around like that. Ah, okay. Cinch it up and then we can just hang them like this. Just like that, yep. Keeps them up off the ground so the critters can't get at them. The mice and stuff. And oh, yeah. the For the Cree people, the value of beaver meat is more important than the, than the pelt. Like, a lot of them, that's their favorite food source. In the, in the winter time they eat beaver and in the, in the spring they, they love goose meat. But uh, it's almost like the beaver's like a, the skin's a byproduct for the Cree people. The, the meat is really important to them. The, the Cree people what they do is they prefer like large and smaller and they'll take the beaver and they'll, they'll, they'll take all the entrails out. And then they'll take the tail off, the feet off, and they take everything, put it back inside and then sew it up and they'll hang it from its, from its front feet to, with a, like a, a stick between the feet like that and they'll put it beside the stove, right beside the stove and they'll put a, a tray underneath it and every so many, the kids will walk by with a stick and, and spin it so it's always cooking like this and all the drippings go down and they got basically roast it right beside their, their cook stove. And uh, that, that's, a traditional, that's the traditional way the Cree people cook, cook beaver, whether it's on the James Bay Coast on our side or over towards the Ungava Way like uh, Quebec side or Ontario side, the Cree people are, are famous for cooking beaver that way. Fur Harvesters NWT wouldn't be possible without Fur Harvesters Auction, selling your fur to the world. Buffalo Airways, the home of the ice pilots. All internet equipment was brought to you by Cascom and Galaxy Broadband. And cruise accommodations were provided by Greenway Realty. Andrew, it's been a pleasure to have you at my trap line in the West Arm Lake Nipissing. And uh, on behalf of myself, Fur Harvesters Auction, Mark Taylor, all the management team, and more importantly, all the trappers of North America, you do a great job. You're a true ambassador to the fur trade. And a lot of people uh, have commented on, on your YouTube videos. And it's been a great pleasure having you at my camp, spending some time together. And uh, I learned a lot. I hope you did too. And it's, it's been a great time. Oh, I sure did. Uh, you know, I'm pretty happy to be here working with you guys from Fur Harvesters and learning on the hands-on experience here, you know. Uh, I'm definitely going to use a lot of these techniques that you guys have shown me over the weekend and it was just a, it was a pleasure here. I know I said it and I'll see it again. It was a pleasure working with you guys here at North Bay and I'm looking forward to coming back next year. We got back all in good order. Spent the next afternoon visiting again and 
skinned a few beavers and caught up and listened to stories about how he traps, how we trap, and just a real good fellowship. No matter who you meet across this country, if there's a trapper, they're the finest group of people you could ever meet in the world. And that's why like, I consider myself blessed, and I know Taylor does as well, that we get to work in this industry surrounded by people that make their living off the land that are true conservationists and whether they're from Northwest Territories or a trapper from Alaska, a guy from North Bay or a guy that's catching beavers in Arkansas. They all have the same care and consideration for the animals and they really have a passion for what they do. Well,